So, a short welcome in German and then I'll switch to English, okay? So, herzlich willkommen an der Universität Bonn. Mein Name ist Michael Hoch, ich bin der Rektor. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir durch das Engagement vieler Kolleginnen und Kollegen, insbesondere Herrn Professor Mayer und Matthews, Professor Matthew Smith und anderen, in der Lage sind, heute diesen fantastischen neuen Studiengang zu eröffnen, Cyber Security. Ich brauche Ihnen nicht zu erzählen, warum das ein interessantes Thema ist. Wir sehen das an den Bewerberzahlen. Der Studiengang ist mehrfach überbucht worden. Wir haben 60 Studienplätze. Hinterher wird Herr Professor Mayer Ihnen das auch nochmal erläutern. Das zeigt, dass da natürlich ein großes Bedürfnis ist in der Gesellschaft, aber insbesondere auch hier in Bonn, dem Zentrum der Cyber Security, wenn ich das sagen darf, mit vielen Institutionen wie dem BSI, Herr Pieper, aber eben auch dem Kommando CIA der Bundeswehr, vielen mittelständischen Unternehmen, aber eben auch den DAX-Unternehmen der Fachhochschule, der Hochschule Bonn-Rhein-Sieg, eben dieses Thema hier lokal auch zu verfolgen. Und ich möchte noch mal, noch mal sagen, dass ich den Kollegen sehr dankbar sind, die diesen Studiengang letztlich aus der Taufe gehoben haben. Dieses Thema ist schon lange bei uns repräsentiert, aber immer im Kontext von Wahlmodulen und jetzt ist es aber, steht es im Zentrum dieser Studiengänge. Herzlichen Dank an die beiden, vielleicht federführend. Ich möchte mich aber auch bei Herrn Backofen bedanken, und werde deswegen jetzt Herr Backofen auf in, jetzt ins Englische wechseln. Yeah? So I'd like to switch to English now. So the first couple of words was only to thank the colleagues because they have established this study program by, on the scratch, right? So and because this is a, a very interesting topic for the society, for many institutions in the society, for companies and so, but, but also think about what is happening now in the city of Bonn where you see all the, the How, how do you call them? Trucks, tractor and trucks, right? Even in, in, for sustainable futures, for agriculture and so. Data science, sensor technology, you know, this will be a very important tool in, in precision uh, farming, right? Which, where, they will, where they observe each, each single plant on the field, right? So very interesting here, the topic of security, uh, but also privacy at the same time. So I'd like to thank uh, Dirk Backhoven also because he's the head of uh, cyber security or security at Deutsche Telekom, because he has been initiating this fantastic initiative which is called Cyber Security Cluster Bonn, where all these institutions, which I have just mentioned in German, are part of. And I think it's only through cooperation, local cooperation, that we can have the critical mass Uh, to, to basically make it make the city of Bonn known for this topic, because um, and 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 we provide a puzzle to this with our study program by forming or in, in a way training young people towards this career, and. Um, But it's clear that, that uh, we have to really make an effort here because of all these institutions. We would like to keep them here in Bonn. We don't. We want, would like to avoid that some of them would maybe then maybe, how to say, move at, at one point. We would like to put them chains on the legs so, so that they can stay here. Uh, and, and this is by, by also providing our share by having the study program, the bachelor's program, and later on a master's program. So let me thank our fantastic guest today, uh, which Professor Smith, so Matthew Smith has organized, right? So we, which we didn't think that this could happen, but in fact, your relationships must be very good. So um, Parisa Tabris is, you know, the director of engineering um, of Google has, has come here on, on her way to Munich, I think, right? On the, there is a headquarter in Munich also. And so, uh, and she will give you some insights, right, into what such a career would look like, right, from her personal point of view also, and of course, from this fantastic company, Google, which, which is, if you want, the, the front runner, right, the pacemaker of, of this field also. So thank you very much for coming. Unfortunately, we, we don't have too much time to talk to each other because I have to leave to Berlin in a couple of minutes by airplane, but um, maybe you could come back, okay? And so, so at, one, at one other time, so, and so that we would have a little bit more time to, to discuss, okay? So again, thank, to, thank you to all of you, in particular also the students for coming here and supporting us, our colleagues, for, for this fantastic event, okay? Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Hoch. And I will give the word to Dirk Backofen for giving us another welcome address. Dirk Backofen, already mentioned, is chairman of the Cybersecurity Cluster Bonn and also head of the Telecom Security. Dirk, the floor is yours. Thanks, Michael. I, I had my own mic. I'm going over here. Yeah. Dear Rector, Professor Dr. Dr. Hoch, uh, dear Parisa, uh, dear Matthew, dear Michael, um, Mr. Pieper, dear guests, I would like to give you also from my perspective as a chairman of the Cybersecurity Cluster Bonn a little bit in perspective about how we see this kind of opening of the new program for cybersecurity at the University of Bonn. Because from our side, and this one I can uh, say at the beginning already, it's a really big event for the entire area of Bonn because uh, we need this kind of education for cybersecurity professionals, for cybersecurity experts, not only in the bachelor course, we need it at the end also in the master uh, course as well. And we have discussed already before, and thank you very much that you have opened already the discussion that after the bachelor, there will be hopefully also a course for the, for the master students uh, for cybersecurity. And I tell you during my speech a little bit something about the cybersecurity cluster and for sure why it's needed to have this kind of young students, young colleagues, which are all sitting here around, uh, and hopefully will, they will be part at the end of such kind of activities in the cluster as well. Professor Hoch has already uh, mentioned that uh, the preconditions that we have here at the venue uh, uh, in Bonn on-prem, they are more or less uh, ideal typic ones. Because we have all the governmental institutions with the Federal Office of the German IT Security for the uh, German uh, government, we have the Cyber Command of the German Armed Forces, uh, we have uh, the universities, the University of Applied Services, Bonn Rhein Sieg, we have the University of Bonn, we have City of Bonn, we have the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce which is supporting this kind of idea. And for sure a lot of companies out of the private sector. Uh, uh, there is the Deutsche Post, uh, DHL, as you know, there is Telecom Security and a lot of other mid-market companies which we shouldn't forget because they are all part of this backbone of cybersecurity in Bonn. And there is no other city in Bonn, uh, sorry, no other city in Germany, uh, in Bonn for sure not, <laughs> uh, no other city in, uh, in Germany which has such kind of uh, really good uh, circumstances at the, at the beginning for such kind of a creation for a cluster. And therefore we said, okay, we have to outline a really objective uh, for our work altogether. And it's all about collaboration. And I come to this in, in, at the end because nobody can do this topic of cybersecurity alone anymore. And I'll tell you in a second why. But uh, to have a clear picture and clear objective, uh, we have outlined in our cluster, which is, by the way, a registered uh, association, as you know, uh, a clear story and say, okay, we would like uh, to uh, make Bonn the heart of cybersecurity in Europe. Why? If you look onto this map, you see Bonn is really located in the middle of Europe. And based on this good kind of uh, pre-conditions that we have, uh, we would like to be really the number one in Europe uh, for cybersecurity. And therefore, uh, it is so warmly welcomed that we have this course of uh, students for cybersecurity here uh, with us. And to make it maybe a little bit more tangible, then I would like to bring this into your uh, mind into. Because everybody is knowing when you speak about Davos, what does it mean for economy leaders? But what could it be if we are able to develop Bonn to become the cybersecurity, uh, the Davos for cybersecurity here uh, in this region? Davos for cybersecurity. Everybody would like to understand, okay, it's not about the economy leaders, it's about the cybersecurity leaders. And this is exactly the next generation of young people which we try to develop into this uh, kind of a uh, status into. This is the starting point of your career, and therefore we are so happy to be part of this game as cluster here together with the University of Bonn. For those which have never heard about uh, the cluster as such, you see a little bit uh, the structure that we have here. We have a management board uh, with eight board members uh, consisting out of the city of Bonn, Chamber of Commerce, big companies like Telecom Security, but also Fraunhofer, we shouldn't forget, uh, when we speak about the educational part. And a lot of uh, uh, the professors here at the university are in parallel, also working, Michael especially, working for Fraunhofer as well, not only for the university. And this all is in the steering uh, committee into, in the advisory board, we have the Federal uh, Office uh, for Cybersecurity, for Information Security of the German government, uh, the Cyber com, uh, Command of the German Armed Forces, as you can see here, and uh, we shouldn't forget as well the police headquarter of Bonn. They are also part of the story in, in our uh, support. And we have at the end already acquired 75 members, all the big companies, as you can see here, not only small ones out of the regions, although an IBM is part of the game, a lot of other uh, big players uh, will following soon. So therefore, we are really playing this game. 
And we are very happy, you can see this here, that the University of Bonn is for sure also part of the game as an associated member of our cluster. And this is something on which we play really this kind of collaboration, this kind of interacting in a joint manner. This is like, uh, exactly how we are so successful and how we can uh, uh, steer this kind of uh, cybersecurity topic uh, further ahead. What are our strategic elements? Six things, and I wouldn't go too much into, but I think first of all, and we had the discussion with the colleagues of the press already beforehand uh, during the press conference, what's about the awareness of cybersecurity? A lot of people speak about those topics, but it's not clear for everybody so far. Therefore, we have still to do some kind of educational work, and uh, I would like to jump uh, for a second to this slide. Therefore, we are organizing, first of all, uh, the first uh, cybersecurity tech summit Europe. The first one was in this year, in March, uh, and the next one will be next year in March on the 11th as well, you see a lot of uh, very important politicians, a lot of uh, CEOs, a lot of international keynote speakers, uh, which have uh, uh, given us a contribution for this kind of a huge event, and this one we will continue. This year the first one, next year, next year already uh, the second one, and this is a story on which everybody here from the university could uh, get benefit from, and therefore we would like to uh, bring this into your mind into. The second thing is here on the right side, the Vice Council of Cybersecurity Experts, also a new thing. Everybody is knowing uh, uh, the Vice Council for the Economy uh, leaders in Germany, the, 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 Deutschen, uh, the Deutschen Weisen, uh, uh, the Wirtschaftsweisen. Um, and this is exactly something on which we thought, okay, we could have those kind of uh, cyber uh, experts, cyber uh, Vice Council uh, members as well. And we are very happy that we have compiled six of the best professors in cybersecurity out of the entire German landscape. Not only Germany, not, not only uh, Bonn, um, we have also Darmstadt, we have Munich uh, in this uh, group in, but we are also very happy that Matthew, Matthew Smith, is one of those professors of the Cyber uh, uh, Wise Council uh, for our experts, and this is exactly how we would like to give advices, really good advices to the German government, to all uh, companies in the private sector and the public sector to have the best uh, development about cybersecurity in place. Um, I would like to jump to this, Secure Digital City. This is the next element to uh, create a really um, yeah, urban district in Bonn in which you can make cybersecurity really tangible for everybody, for each human being, not only for experts. This is something on which we are working together with the city of Bonn, and uh, this brings us also something of new awareness uh, for everybody into life. And if you look onto those things which are more uh, in the area of the scientific uh, and educational part, then you see already uh, that uh, everything about uh, cooperative research uh, and publications, uh, everything about cooperative training and uh, uh, the educational approach is something that we have to have on the university side. Here with the University of Bonn, but also with the University of Applied Services, uh, Bonn Rhein Sieg. And this gives at the end, hopefully, if we see the graduates afterwards, the right balance to not only to leave the city of Bonn afterwards and to stay here, to create some kind of incubator programs for cybersecurity, to have the right companies exactly here on prem in, uh, in Bonn. This is exactly for what we are working for. And if we speak about the role of the university, then I think Everybody uh, uh, should understand that uh, based on this uh, perfect uh, symbiotic approach coming from the six existing excellence clusters which we have here uh, at the university, we bring now with the new course of cybersecurity something into life which will help us definitely to uh, uh, fulfill the demand that you are seeing here. In 2022, there is uh, expected a demand of cybersecurity professionals in Germany alone of 1.8 million experts. Do you have an understanding about uh, where they are coming from? Currently, this market about cybersecurity experts is more or less empty. There is nobody available anymore. And I would be more than happy if all of them, which uh, all of you, which uh, will hopefully be uh, based and graduate of this kind of a story at the end, uh, will come to the industry and will give us uh, at the end the uplift about the, the topics uh, that we are seeing here. This is exactly uh, what uh, we would like to, to support, especially in the collaboration between the private sector, public sector, and for sure uh, with all the universities here. Uh, on-prem in Bonn. So, my last story about is uh, in a political message, because you should understand that uh, based on the increased numbers of cyber attacks, uh, we need a collaboration of everybody. Because I give you only one figure. Uh, we as Deutsche Telekom, we are confronted with every single working day with 42 million attacks, cyber attacks, 42 million. The peak was uh, in May, 57 million attacks. This is a really uh, an amazing figure coming from 4 million per day two years ago. 
This is exactly where we are living. And so therefore we need a line of one because the army of the bad is already outside there. But where is the army of the good? The, which is standing in the line of one, using the same high professional tools, the same knowledge, which you will get here out of the university to protect the entire landscape, the entire society against cyber attacks. So therefore, I say we need an immunization of the entire society against cyber attacks. And this is only possible if everybody is working uh, together, if you have the right collaboration. Therefore, this cluster is so a perfect one. And uh, at the end, hopefully, we can uh, form together with you this army of the good. And to give you a little bit of impression, emotional at the end, I have prepared a little bit of uh, a movie about. Sorry for the English speaking guys, it's only available in, in German. A two minutes uh, impression about what will be the outcome of all those activities together with the university here in Bonn. In naher Zukunft entspringen die sichersten Datenströme Europas am Rhein. Willkommen in der Cyber Security City Bonn. Wo alles geht. In Dauerlauf. Innovativ. Intuitiv. Superlativ. Mit einem Swipe, mit einem Klick, aber vor allem mit Sicherheit. Denn die eigentliche Revolution ist mehr als nur digital. Sie ist emotional. Jenseits von Megabytes gibt sie den Menschen ein Gigagefühl. Das beruhigende Gefühl bei allen virtuellen Vorgängen ganz selbstverständlich sicher zu sein. Secure Digital Payment, sensible Datentransfers, Verified Identities, sicherer als jemals zuvor. Denn hier kooperieren die besten Cyber Security Spezialisten des Landes. Forschungseinrichtungen und Institute entwickeln gemeinsam immer bessere Schutzsysteme. In der eigenen Akademie wird das Know-how ständig erweitert und gleichzeitig weitergegeben. Ideal für High Potential Mitarbeiter und Startups. Das Digitalisierungsprojekt Smart City Bonn legte den Grundstein. Entstanden ist ein innovativer IT-Security-Standort, an dem Wirtschaft, Politik und Forschung ihre einzigartigen Kompetenzen optimal vereinen. Im Cyber Security Cluster Bonn come to the heart of cyber security in Europe. This is a heartbeat of cyber security here uh, in Bonn and we are very happy and I'm going back now to the presentation. Uh, uh, we are very happy that uh, we would like to congratulate here the entire University of Bonn to this new course of cybersecurity because we expect already, as I said, uh, the creates of this kind of a course already now. This is exactly the story, so therefore we can't wait. Three years, this is for me too long. Uh, therefore, uh, from our point of view, we wish you a lot of uh, engagement, we wish you a lot of insights about cybersecurity and for sure also a lot of success. And at the end, hopefully, we can give you, not only out of the university, also in the strong collaboration between the practical work which we are bringing into this kind of educational stuff in the university, a lot of good orientation for all the young people, for all the students, uh, to be at the end really a cybersecurity expert in, in this manner. And hopefully you will stay here in Bonn in the region because we have so much demand about cybersecurity professionals. So therefore, good Good luck, and uh, I wish you all the best for this kind of new uh, cybersecurity course here at the University of Bonn. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome. My name is Matthew. Uh, I'm a professor for IT security, and in particular the human factors of IT security at the University of Bonn and the Fraunhofer FKIE. You'll be seeing me in the third semester in the class Human Factors of IT Security, Usable Security and Privacy, we call it. And today it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Parisa, who's come all the way from California to give our keynote address for the inaugural event of the Bachelor in Cybersecurity at the University of Bonn. When we were tasked with organizing this event, we made a list of people who we could imagine who would give a great speech and who would be a, uh, a role model for you starting in this area. And she was at the top of the list. 
and I couldn't be more happy that she accepted our invitation to come here. I actually met Parisa in 2016 on the Usenix Enigma conference, which she co-founded and co-organized. At the time, her official job title was Security Princess, um, which she picked herself because she thought security engineer was just a little bit too boring, rightly so. Um, she since then has been promoted a couple of times. She is now the Senior Director of Engineering at Google, um, although she still quite likes the security princess. So maybe sec Senior Security Princess now. <laughs> um, as the Senior Director of Engineering at Google, she's currently responsible for the security of Chrome. And Chrome, as you know, is the most used browser on, on this planet. And I think in 2016, two billion active installs. I'm not sure what the numbers now are, but they won't have gone down. So this is a massively important piece of software, and she's the head of that security department. She's also in charge of Project Zero, uh, the team of elite security experts who poke hole in all sorts of software, both at Google and worldwide. And she also has personal experience in breaking software and has done a lot to help people repair these things. Apart from these very impressive technical skills, she's also some of an artist. Um, she enjoys doing digital art and glass blowing, I found out, which is very interesting. Um, but maybe most relevantly for this audience, she's also passionate about teaching the next generation of cybersecurity experts. And that's why I'm so happy that she's here. Not only did she co-found and organize using Enigma, she's also, uh, as a as a reaction, I'll tell you about, she founded the Our Security Advocates Conference. And that was when RSA, I believe, had 40 keynote speakers, um, 39 of whom were white males. And uh, within just a couple of days, uh, Parisa and some colleagues of her organized a, a counter conference to show that security is much broader than this. And with that, I'd like to welcome Parisa and say this is going to be a fantastic talk, a very motivational talk, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I will. So please welcome. All right, well, uh, thank you for the awesome introduction, Matthew, and the welcome from everybody who is part of organizing this event. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here, the Davos of cybersecurity. It's my first time to Bonn, and uh, to be clear, I came specifically for this event and really to speak to the students. And I have a team in Munich, so I'll see them afterwards, but uh, I, I definitely came for this event, and I felt very welcome the whole time. This morning I had a, a welcome parade of tractors from uh, the hotel, which was uh, lovely. I actually went to university um, in a, a school that uh, had a lot of farmers nearby too, and so I think being near students and being near tractors made me think about my own uh, university days. But uh, first, I want to congratulate the students, and really, this talk is is for you. And I welcome anyone who's not a student to listen. But I really wanted to just be speaking to to you, and I want to start with uh, a really heartfelt congratulations because I know that Bonn is uh, a university of excellence in Germany, and so you all must have worked very hard to get here, and I know that there's uh, different, uh, people are in different points in their career, but um, I think it's very exciting to be part of something new, and so congratulations to you. Um, now is a really uh, important and exciting time to be working in computer security, and so uh, I think that it's a great time to start. The world's dependence on interconnected systems is only increasing, and so uh, I think that um, it's one of the most important missions that you could work on to really keep people, our friends and family, uh, our businesses uh, safe as people use the internet. And so uh, it's an honor to meet some of the people, and I hope to speak to some of you later, that will be helping to make things better because we have a lot of problems. <laughs> so uh, I look forward to working with you. Um, I wanted to start by just sharing a little bit of my own path in security, um, just in case it's instructive to you uh, as you kind of figure out your own path and career over the next couple of years. And so I'll start from way, way back. Uh, and that's a picture of me in kindergarten. 
And uh, as Matthew said, when I was uh, little, I wanted to be an artist. Um, I don't know exactly the age ranges of students, and I'm not going to ask, but when I was growing up, there was no computer in my house, there was no access to the internet, um, and I thought I wanted to be an artist because I liked to draw and paint and just create things. And I actually thought that engineers were people that drove trains. Um, and uh, later on, uh, we actually did get a personal computer in my family's house. Uh, I remember it was a Pentium 4. And at the time, we had dial-up internet. And if you don't know what dial-up internet is, lucky for you. Uh, but I had to, it, it essentially meant very, very slow connection. And I had to share the internet connection with my family, who also wanted to make telephone calls, and with my two brothers. Um, and so in high school, I, I had used the computer a little bit to play games and to talk to my friends on AOL Instant Messenger, which also recently retired. Um, but I really didn't know what uh, computers, uh, you know, how they worked, um, the potential for them and the internet. And so I ended up having to choose a major um, and didn't really have the foresight that I, I suppose many of you have. Um, I liked math, and because I, in the, in the United States, I knew I wanted to go to college, I ended up choosing computer engineering as a major, mostly just on a whim. I liked math. At that point, I realized engineers actually were, were people that created things, and partially, I was like, well, I'll start there, and if I don't like it, then I will change to something different. Um, but quite a random decision. And I share this really because I want to bust the myth that you need to be an, an expert either in computers or in security kind of as you're starting out. And all of you are so much farther ahead than, than where I was uh, in your, your career. Um, so started computer engineering, took a lot of math and core classes. I see there's a lot of parallels in, in what uh, you have in, in your uh, curriculum requirements. Um, and one of the things that I thought I wanted to do was actually get into web development or graphic design uh, as a career. And so when I was uh, 19 years old, and at this point I actually had my own computer and high-speed internet in the, the dormitories, uh, which was student housing. Um, so I taught myself how to do basic web development. Um, I learned about HTML and JavaScript and cascading style sheets, um, and just the basics to put together a website and web application. And for me, this was really powerful because I was able to iterate really quickly uh, and create something, which, which I thought was artistic, in my small dorm room. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money, and so um, in terms of you know, having, uh, I didn't need a lot of art supplies or space because I could iterate so quickly on the web and create something and then share it with other people by just by sharing a, a, a link. And that was really how I first learned to program. And um, I started actually with uh, computer engineering and, and uh, you know, doing electronics labs and, and fell in love with, with coding, in part because of this really quick you know, launch, iterate, um, being able to make something and uh, update it very quickly. And, and so realized that I actually enjoyed programming and wanted to work more in programming. This, uh, I, I used, this site service still exists, but I wouldn't expect necessarily anybody to know about it. Um, I created some websites on AngelFire, which was a web hosting service, and you could have a free account if it actually showed, uh, if you allowed it to show ads uh, as well. And uh, for me, this was exciting because I had a way to make art. I didn't have to pay for my own web hosting, but I thought the ads looked uh, ugly, and so I wanted to find a way to kind of block the ads so that I could have still the free hosting, um, but not have to pay for, for ads. Um, and the irony of this is I work at Google. It's, it's no secret that a lot of Google's revenue comes from advertising on the web, and so I'll just throw it out there that the irony is not lost on me. Um, but essentially, you know, I, I was just like, oh, these ads are ugly, and I don't want to have to pay for a service. And so I found ways to block the ads, and, and to be clear, this wasn't any kind of like advanced hacking, um, but via reading online forums and also just playing around with um, the script that I was providing into the service and how they would actually render that, I found ways so that uh, AngelFire wasn't able to actually render those ads and they would uh, disappear from the page. And for me, that gave me the full canvas, you know, and... and uh, um, Eventually, AngelFire would change how they uh, inserted ads, and, and I would have to update my scripts. And now, this is known as cross-site scripting, um, which is probably the most 
voluminous type of security vulnerability there is, but it actually was my entrance way into web hacking and web security. And um, just got me very interested, not necessarily in building things, but in finding ways to, uh, I guess, evolve systems or applications into things that weren't intended uh, in the first place. And uh, I ended up um, uh, changing majors to computer science and joining um, a hacking club in addition to a web uh, development club taking a couple internships, one at a IT company, one at a, a national um, uh, a government lab within the United States, and doing web security, uh, sorry, uh, network security, and then doing an internship at Google, because at the time I was using Google as my search engine and thought that it would be interesting to work on uh, real software and, and try to secure you know, actual, actual software, because I wanted a taste of, of research as well as industry. Uh, I really enjoyed my time at, at, at Google and decided to um, uh, join Google as a full-time uh, engineer and uh, sort of the, the rest is history. And, and I kind of have this illustration in part to show that there were a lot of different forks in my uh, career path. You know, at some point I wanted to pursue a PhD. At some point I thought maybe I should actually just go into traditional software engineering because I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get a job in security. And if there's anything you leave with, you should know that you'll be able to get a job in security. Uh, um, but I, I remember actually having a lot of anxiety when I was a student about, you know, what will I be doing in the next 10 years? And uh, don't worry about it. If I could tell myself anything, a um, younger self, don't worry about it. There's a lot of forks in the road, and this was my path. Um, I think alternative ones could have also been uh, interesting and enjoyable, but that was uh, my path. As a story, the security princess background is um, I was going to Japan, and uh, my colleagues told me, well, if you go to Japan, it's really important to get business cards because exchanging business cards is um, sort of this, uh, you know, there's an expectation if you're there in official business. And uh, as Matthew said, I thought security engineer was just kind of um, boring. And actually, at the time, I don't think people even knew what it meant. And so I chose um, security princess as a joke, and it just kind of stuck with me, uh, and I've enjoyed it because I think it's ambiguous enough to pe where people don't know uh, what you do, and, and also your responsibility is sort of uh, all over the place, and, and I enjoy sort of working in a breadth of things. So that's the story. Uh, I've worked on Chrome for the past six years, and today uh, uh, I leave Chrome security and Chrome privacy as well as actually all of engineering for um, uh, building the browser on Windows, Mac OS, Linux iOS, Android, uh, and so get to learn a lot about um, those underlying operating systems as well as um, client software and, of course, web software as we try to build this window for um, billions of people around the web to uh, stay safe and make that easy. Um, uh, I think that usable security is actually one of the most uh, important emerging areas right now because a lot of security experts have built um, security into software in a way that just isn't uh, usable. And, and humans are smart, and so if something is inconvenient, they will not do it. Uh, and uh, yes, met, met Matthew uh, at, at USENIX Enigma and was uh, honored to come out of a, because I think he's doing uh, amazing work um, and uh, uh, wanted to come and meet some of the people he works with. So uh, that's my story, and I want to um, again speak to the students about you know, you have a challenging curriculum ahead of you, and I just want to offer some advice um, beyond, you know, doing well in your courses, which I think is uh, important but won't be sufficient. And in some ways, this advice is something I would tell my younger self. Um, hopefully, it's not uh, obvious, and um, I will share some, you know, stories along with it, and then I have time for questions uh, from anybody, and, and you're welcome to ask me anything about Google, Chrome, or even my, my own career. So, um, first and importantly, I think that working in security, um, everyone should know that it's not exactly like uh, the movies. So, who has seen The Matrix? Okay, cool. So, if that inspired you to work in security, that's okay, but I just need you to know <laughs> It's not exactly like that. Um, has anyone seen the movie Hackers? Okay. 
I'd recommend it. Also not how it works in, in real, real life, but a cult, a cult favorite. Um, has anyone watched the TV series Mr. Robot? Okay, wow, okay. You've seen it all. I hope this isn't discouraging, but that's not, how it, that's not actually how it, how it works in real life. Um, Mr. Robot actually is one of the first TV series that has a dedicated technical consultant, and so that series actually does an extremely uh, good job of making sure that the actual um, uh, exploits and demos are practical and, and real world. But um, I want to bust a couple of, of uh, myths here, um, because I love watching movies and TV shows, but I do it for the escape. Uh, you know, in the fantasy, and I want um, everyone to know that day-to-day -day work, or at least my experience, is is not uh, like depicted on the screen. And, and I think this is relevant for most professions. Um, I grew up with a family who worked in healthcare, and so they were very critical of a TV series called ER because you know the emergency room was never nearly as sexy or efficient as like what it's perceived on TV. And so security is the same. Um, First, you don't have to be a man or a genius or programming since you were uh, a baby. Um, you also don't have to be like this antisocial uh, person that only likes to work alone in a basement. Um, in practice, I think that real security work is extremely collaborative and being able to work effectively with other people is one of the most important skills um, beyond the technical topics you learned. Um, and then also, unfortunately, progress uh, does not happen as fast as it happens on TV. You know, within TV, you can crack a password, find a vulnerability, exploit it, and like all within about 20 minutes. And um, you know, I've actually talked with um, producers and artists who create sort of you know uh, TVs and stories, and. I understand why they do that, because in reality, a lot of the work is you in front of a computer, maybe working with other people just for hours on end, and that's actually not fun to watch. Um, but things happen a little bit more slowly. Um, but all of that said, um, and even if I haven't you know, deciphered code from an underground layer, um, I, I still think that this is one of the most exciting and important and rewarding fields to work in. Um, and I uh, want to share a little bit more about that, um, because while you know, here we're establishing a whole curriculum around it, it still is very much an emerging field. And so I think that's an exciting thing to be a part of. One of the questions I get asked regularly um, is, what are the best classes, what are the most important classes to take so that I can be successful in cybersecurity? And um, my answer is always that there's no perfect and there's no best. Um, security is such a broad interdisciplinary field that um, you know, I really think that part of it is personal choice and personal interest. Um, we need people that can build and design secure systems. We also need people that can break and test those systems. And we have people that try to detect intrusions. And then we also have people that have to handle those intrusions. And um, lots of things in between. And so there's, there's a core kind of technical component to the work, but also a lot of complexity with people and uh, law and policy and international relations and so much more. And so really, this is a field where um, you can choose your own adventure and choose your own career. Still, uh, I, I do think that the core curriculum that's offered um, in this program um, is, is really aligned to what I would recommend in terms of like what is that foundation to work in cybersecurity. Um, and, and in general, I think of applied computer science as, as very important. How do computers work? How does software work? Um, uh, in part because so much of computer science is really just solving problems with layers of abstraction. So this is a, an image I, I just stole from the internet. Um, and I, I, you can see at the bottom, we sort of have the physical layer, um, and that's sort of where I started my studies, uh, and have so much respect for people who work very close to the metal uh, and are really thinking about kind of electronics. And, and as you go up, um, you have where I ended up, it's sort of like the JavaScript hacker, uh, and layers of abstraction uh, in, in between. So that's like what computer science is. Um, and Often, security is really about finding those assumptions and those flawed assumptions um, uh, in those layers of abstraction or in the implementation um, and, and any bugs in those. And then 
kind of once you find those flaws or, or bugs, uh, figuring out how to either exploit them and take advantage of, of the system or uh, fix them. And I would say that we definitely need more people to figure out how to fix them. Um, I started my career on the offensive side of finding vulnerabilities and, and now spend most of my time in, in defense and trying to make systems more resilient. And I can say that um, defense is, is definitely harder than, than offense, uh, but helpful to be working on both. Um, as I said, this field is still relatively new, and so I expect a number of specialties to emerge. Um, but if I could offer you any advice, it's to don't stress about f specializing too soon. Right now, you're so early in your career, and I think that you really can benefit from taking a, a broad uh, set of classes. And I know that there's uh, an elective portion um, you know, of the curriculum, and so take advantage of that to take classes that you, you, you know, might not, um, you're like slightly interested in, but um, aren't sure if you want to do. And this is such a good time to um, figure out your own personal interests and what you like. Uh, I can almost guarantee that it will be some space um, in cybersecurity and really you, you end up just, I think, enjoying things a lot more and being better at it if it really uh, hits at, a, at an inner interest. So um, try things out and you might surprise yourself. One of the things that I personally regret um, was not taking more humanities classes and, and uh, communication courses because I really didn't appreciate how much of security is about understanding people, um, understanding how they use technology, so human factors, um, understanding people's motivations, whether it's you know, engineers and how they're thinking about building systems or users and, and you know, what user problems um, they're most trying to solve. Um, or just, you know, affecting change in organizations or, or societies at, at large. Um, the internet is like the largest shared infrastructure that knows no country boundaries. And so when you're trying to advance security on that, it really is an ecosystem problem. And so um, I wish I had taken more classes outside of just core engineering. And Honestly, that's probably where I spend a lot of my free time uh, now, learning about psychology or design uh, or economics uh, or policy or law, because I realize how important it is to understand those, those fields beyond just sort of the tech. Um, so if you have opportunity to take those, I would definitely recommend it. Um, and then uh, additionally, I think security is not a passive field. And so you will learn a lot from textbooks, I have no doubt. You'll take exams. Um, you'll probably have to do some homework. But I think to really learn and just even understand what you like, um, it's so important to actually do projects and to write code and to find um, ways to break code or to fix code and um, to teach and work with others because I think that's what you'll also really come away with. And, and I went to an amazing uh, university that had uh, great professors and, and great courses, but where I learned the most, it really was with other students and in actually doing projects. Um, I'll, I'll offer just a couple of examples of things to do because, um, you know, it's easy to say, you know, don't just read, do. Um, these are examples of things that I did and that might be available to you or can be ideas for you to start yourself. And so student projects, as I said, I was in two student clubs, a web development club and a security club, and I learned a lot from just, you know, um, working on projects together. And to be clear, I've written a lot of vulnerable software because it's very easy to write vulnerable software. Uh, and I have gotten my services uh, exploited, um, but I was never afraid to uh, kind of put something together and, and ended up learning a lot from it. Um, open source projects are an amazing way to get some practical experience. Um, you know, they can be overwhelming. Chrome is, is an open source project. We would love to have student contributors. We have had student contributors, but I could also imagine it being a little bit intimidating. And so you can start really small by fixing bugs or even just fixing typos and documentation. Um, and you, you kind of build up from there. Um, doing research with professors, um, hackathons. Uh, I don't know if there's a culture of hackathons, but if not, I see people nodding, which is great. Um, and if not, like, bolster the culture of hackathons. Um, I spent a lot of time on Hackett sites um, and doing capture the flag contests. Um, you know, if this is interesting to you, it's a great way, again, to get practical experience and just to, to meet other people and learn. 
Uh, there's a lot of organizations that need IT help, and they may not have money to pay you, but they'll take it, w whatever you can get. And so find opportunities to volunteer. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability reward programs where you can actually make, make money, and some people actually make a living off of these programs. And then importantly, um, I think teaching other people, even if you're not an expert on the topic, but just sharing what you've learned with other people is a great way to, I think, uncover hidden topics of a, corner, uh, of a, of a topic. Um, that you know you maybe didn't even know yourself, and I was the hacking club that I was uh, a part of. We used to meet on Fridays and just teach each other things that we learned, and we weren't experts on this. In some ways, we were just sort of regurgitating some uh, you know something that we learned online, but thought was cool. And I think that so much of security is information sharing. Um, and I think finding a way to to share and engage also will. Um, uh, lead to a lot of deeper learning as well as connections. A lot of what I have learned has been from anecdotes, um, from friends, from coworkers, from security blogs, from public mailing lists, um, from Twitter, from you know conference papers or conferences. And so, find ways to to get involved. Um, you don't have to be an expert. And I know you're starting off your your program now, but get involved early, and that will open up more opportunities. Um, OK, this is important because, uh, again, I think there's this myth uh, on TV that you know, the genius is able to kind of crack the code or exploit or defend the system within 20 minutes. Um, and I think uh, that can be discouraging if you're struggling and actually finding this topic to be difficult. Um, Security is hard, and you should absolutely expect to work hard, uh, struggle, fail, get frustrated, still get frustrated. Um, and you know, to some extent, that's probably true um, with most fields. But I think with um, security, there's really no rule book. And it's a very new field. And so you're helping us to kind of develop this. So if you're struggling and you find that this is hard, that's working as intended. Um, you know, part of this field is you're going to constantly need to learn new things. Um, the technical landscape uh, that ultimately we're trying to secure is evolving super rapidly. Um, it's much more difficult to deprecate insecure technology. Um, and I found that it's actually you know, a challenge to kind of deprecate old security before we kind of introduce uh, new, uh, more in improved security. You know, if you're on the defensive side, attackers have um, the easier job. They have time and resources on their side, and they can be quick to adapt to existing defenses. I think security can be kind of stressful because you're dealing with very ambiguous problems, and um, we have imperfect solutions. So if you're looking sort of for a very clear success, um, it's going to be hard to find in security. Um, we have imperfect data and, and very real threats to users that are complex beyond just, again, computer systems. This really goes to kind of the, the fundamental, like, why do we have security problems in the world uh, type stuff. And I think because it's difficult to measure success with security, in my experience, people tend to notice failure. We have this, this saying, um, or the press in the US have a, have a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and so that really means, like, if it's sort of um, kind of uh, this like travesty or something downside, uh, like all the systems are getting hacked, it will tend to be a headline. And I, I think that's a, a separate problem with the media, but you'll tend to hear about kind of how everything is failing. Um, and, and in my experience, people are just much more noticed to, to much more likely to notice failure and problems than they are to kind of notice advances. So, you know, this area, this whole space of work is ultimately about risk mitigation. Um, there's no perfect solution. And that can feel challenging because you can kind of feel like you're you know, pushing this, this rock up a hill and, and will never be successful. Um, but it's incredibly important. And I think one of the things as, as a human race we actually have to get better about is, is risk mitigation in general. And so this is sort of that space of complexity. Um, if you're stuck, if you're struggling, just know it's OK. And here's some tips. Um, one, I've heard, I've, I've, I've talked to some of my colleagues that this is the best club at in Bonn, Carpe. And so 
for those who like to dance, you can go to the club, or you can take a nap, or like walk, you know, across the Rhine, and um, really like step away from the computer, uh, clear your mind. Sometimes you just actually like need to to do something different. And then also, uh, I think uh, fuel is important too. And so again, like if you're really frustrated, just step away from the problem, have a snack. Uh, again, I have not been to. I, I did eat some Aribo, uh, which was uh, lovely. I didn't realize it was from Bonn. I heard this is the best pizza at 3 a.m. At 3 a.m. At 3 a.m. Um, uh, you should definitely eat. Um, uh, develop healthy eating habits too, because your metabolism will slow down. And so, like, you should also get exercise and, and eat vegetables. Um, another big thing is just ask for help. Um, you know, I've been successful in large part due to the support, advice, mentorship that I had from a lot of awesome people. And that was colleagues, so help each other out. Um, professors, ask your professors, they're here to help you. Um, other experts in the field, a lot of like people online that I just ended up interacting with on, on forums or uh, met in you know, group settings. Um, so ask for help. Importantly, if you need to ask for help, make sure you do some due diligence beforehand and make it as easy as possible for people to help you, especially if it's you know, someone who's an expert or professional um, and you're much more likely to get help or get a, a response if you ask a really well-scoped question and sort of say, like, I tried these things and it didn't work. Um, but ask for help. Um, and then another thing I will say is that um, it's an evolving field and there's a lot of ego in security, and so I've definitely um, uh, interacted with jerks in this field. I can't see any jerks in the audience, but it's sometimes hard to know. And uh, I think I'll just say there's a lot of chauvinism in, in the information security uh, industry. Um, and sometimes, you know, this, this conversation will quickly turn into who's the most elite and, and uh, who's um, the you know, the smartest, and that can happen online or, or in a conference. Um, I remember being discouraged when I was in university because other people had just way more programming experience than I did, and I felt like an imposter because it was taking me longer to do the homework and, and I didn't have as much familiarity. Um, don't get discouraged. In my experience, most of the people who have this huge ego do not last very long. Nobody wants to work with them. And honestly, um, hard work, perseverance, and thinking about just learning more so than failure is so much more important um, to be successful in cybersecurity, but also just your career in general. And so um, even though you'll struggle, you know, you may have to uh, take long breaks and you will fail or learn. Um, I also just want to say, stay optimistic. Um, like I said, we will focus, and the world kind of focuses when things break. So you probably have heard so much more about all of the attacks and how everything is uh, uh, broken, and it's hard for us to keep pace with innovation and common bugs that we've known about for decades, like buffer overflows. They're, they're still present, and they're still used to, to harm people. Um, I try to stay optimistic, uh, in part because I think that's a survival mechanism. Um, but also because I also think uh, deeply and believe deeply in, in a lot of the opportunity that technology has afforded uh, the world. And to be clear, I'm not saying that we don't have plenty of problems, um, but I also think um, about um, the advantages of information sharing and connection um, that technology has afforded. And so it's a, a challenging problem, but one where I genuinely think security or the cutting edge of security is so much more advanced from when it was 10 years ago. And that we can continue to advance this. Um, uh, and I remain hopeful because I, I see kind of uh, next generations of, of people really wanting to engage and, and improve uh, things. So. Um, one more thing, a uh, reason to be optimistic, is you'll absolutely have career opportunities. <laughs> um, there is a huge gap between the needs of uh, the world in terms of security experts and the talent available. And so, um, uh, you know, assuming you want a job at some point, uh, and uh, I think you'll have a, a lot of options. Um, we've actually brought four people from Matthew's group to Google, um, and so I apologize because I know we want to chain everybody to Bond. For anybody who doesn't want to be chained to Bond for the rest of your life, I will 
I'm, I'm interested in talking to you. Uh, you know, you should stay here first and foremost, but if not, then uh, we also um, are very interested in uh, growing kind of our security talent um, at Google and in Chrome. Um, uh, earlier this year, we actually opened a safety engineering center in Munich. Um, this is where Germany's largest Google office is and um, announced, uh, you know, we plan to grow it by quite a lot uh, over the next couple of years. Um, you know, in part really just because I, th I think um, the world recognizes Germany as, as a leader in security and privacy, um, and uh, this seems a good place to, you know, recruit talent and to kind of advance um, the state of the internet and technology uh, when it comes to safety. Google's just one company of many different companies, and so um, you'll have options. And, and that's also kind of a, a nice uh, thing to know because uh, most people have to pay the bills. So I'll end it there and just say good luck with all of your studies. Um, I hope you have fun. And uh, it's a really precious time in your life, and so I wish you uh, the best. And I'm happy to answer any questions if people want. Um, I'll just pause there. Thanks. Yeah, so the idea for the next point on the agenda is to give you some more insights into careers, cybersecurity careers. Of course, cybersecurity careers that have to do with, uh, with, with Bonn. So actually, we will hear two people that are still in Bonn. And I think the start will be Alena, who will tell us a few things about her career and what does it have to do with the University of Bonn. Alena. Um, so, hello, my name is Alina Nayakshina and I'm a PhD student of the Usable Security and Privacy Group at the University of Bonn and today I would like to give you some insights into the question, should I consider doing a PhD after my studies? And first of all, I will talk about some advantages and the responsibility of doing a PhD. Um, I think the most important aspect is that you will get a chance to work on projects of your own interest. That means you can choose a topic which you really like or which you really love and you can work on this topic for years. And only you are responsible for your success. Um, furthermore, you're directly involved in scientific research and the development of state-of-the-art technology, so you will be the first one working on and developing a modern and up-to-date technology, and you will contribute to research and the economy, and maybe one day you will save the world, or you will destroy it, let's see. And um, you will also be involved in teaching and supervising other students, other bachelor and master students and you can pass your knowledge, your experience to them, you can help them through their studies. As I mentioned before, you're also responsible for your success. You have to publish your work on scientific uh, conferences and there are always deadlines which you have to meet, so sometimes it can become a little bit stressful. Uh, and now I will give you some insights into my experiences of doing the PhD. I am uh, conducting research for the Usable Security and Privacy Group and um, one research question which I worked on was how should software be designed to help end users to use it in a secure way? And um, I was investigating the mental models of mobile communication, so we conducted some studies with end users. And for example, we found out that um, end users believe, don't trust end to end encryption of WhatsApp, for example. And I think the uh, most, and my current research question which I'm working on right now is how can we support software developers, so you are the future software developers, to produce usable and secure software? And uh, we conducted some studies with students, with freelancers, and also with developers from companies. And we found out that if you're not explicitly ask uh, developers to store user passwords securely in a database, they simply do not do it. And if they consider security, they often use outdated methods or they have misconceptions about secure password storage. 
And although computer science is such a technical field, uh, what I really liked about my PhD was that I was able to work with end users and with developers, and it was possible to work with humans. So I pretty loved this kind of research field. And there, you can collaborate with other researchers all over the world, and pr you can present your results on scientific conferences, and you can exchange your ideas with other researchers all over the world. And the next famous um, conference will be in Hawaii. Just saying, just think about that. And I think you will learn some really important um, and helpful skills for the future after you have done your PhD. You will know how to find answers because you have, you have spent many, many years trying to find answers to the world's toughest and unknown questions. You will don't fear failure because you have learned from it. You will always um, learn experimental mistakes, unsurprising results, and you will learn to deal with that. And last but not least, you need to work in a team to achieve your goals, but you also have to be the first one to publish your results, so you will get a lot of knowledge in this field of competition and collaboration fields, which will help you in your future life. Thank you very much. I hope you have the time to read that. Uh, it's really uh, funny, just try to read that, but that's all for, for my side for today, or just right now. Hi, I'm Sergei, and I'm a former uh, PhD student of the University uh, of Bonn myself. And at some point of our studies, we decided to create a company based on the uh, research we've been doing. And what we want to do is to simplify software testing in software companies. And I'm just telling you a short story how we came to that. So the main reason for uh, most of the vulnerabilities inside uh, the code is this guy. Actually, it could be also me or anyone in Parisa's team. And people, especially <laughs> who are working under pressure, they um, yeah, forget uh, to write tests or sometimes they avoid it because they are quite confident that uh, everything will go well. But uh, reading the headlines of newspapers, we know that uh, it doesn't. And if we t uh, speak to academics and uh, I think uh, to the lectures uh, uh, where professors said automated software testing helping the developers is a solved problem, just use fuzzing and symbolic code execution and then you will be all right, your software will be good, um, didn't turn out to be that well in practice because outside of companies like Google or Microsoft, no one actually uses those techniques. And we've been uh, talking a lot to uh, the developers during our uh, research back then and now even more as a company. And we get the feedback that all those mechanisms to automate software testing uh, is too complicated. And uh, if we want to help with that, uh, yeah, we have two solutions. One is getting more security experts who are familiar with those techniques. And if you look at Google, they are hiring a a everyone who knows fuzzing because uh, they use it a lot uh, in their uh, company. But uh, the problem is that all the other companies, let's say the companies in Germany, we haven't met a German company using fuzzing inside software development yet. And uh, this is a big problem. And this is why our vision is to make uh, an easier access to modern software testing techniques uh, by providing interfaces that uh, users uh, are able to use the techniques. And uh, yeah, basically uh, this was uh, quite challenging because back then when we were university students and were using the techniques, we expected that if we go to companies, everyone will know all the new newest techniques, but our experience in the end was uh, that uh, yeah, no one actually did. So we kind of have to create a story. And this is completely different from academia where we learned uh, or where we sold solutions to some problems. But here the companies don't even know that there is a problem. And yeah, if you want to know why we got an award this year from Bosch for the most innovative startup, uh, we can talk afterwards. Thank you.
So, hello everybody. My name is um, Thomas Barbos and I work for Telecom Security. And um, I actually got chained to Bond, so um, I worked or I've worked already for uh, three organizations within the security, cyber security um, cluster. And I would like to give you first a quick um, um, summary of my career and um, give you some ideas how it um, actually um, could look like, your career could look like. So, Actually, before actually entering um, university, um, I became really interested in um, programming because I wanted to know how computers actually, um, how one can control them. So I started, um, I saved, taught myself um, um, programming. I went to a bookstore and bought this uh, book, Delphi for Kids, with this tiny cute rabbit and um, did it in my free time. So back in 2006, nobody actually um, could imagine how important cybersecurity will be, so and and even computer science was not that um, a popular choice among students, and so because I was kind of interested in um, computer science and pro programming, I I took this innocent decision, um, one could say naive decision, because I did not think about consequences, about a career, about money you will make with this. I took um, computer science. Pure, purely because I, I, lo um, I love programming and so I studied it. Um, actually, I studied quite broadly, so um, um, this is uh, where I think I, bought, uh, I, I did my, I um, built my foundation um, because I actually wanted to go into compiler construction, operating system um, internals, but there weren't any courses at that time. And so I did some computer graphic stuff and something there, something here. And in 2009, um, I attended a project group, Mayweather Bootcamp, here at the university. And this is still offered here, and I can recommend this to everybody. And this get me really hooked on Mayweather analysis. So afterwards, um, I did also, um, I worked at another organization here, Founder of FKE, for um, almost eight years um, um, in research because I was really interested in getting more into details of malware and operating system internals. And um, I can really co recommend um, doing a PhD afterwards, which I, which I did at the University of Bonn here. And lately I've joined um, Telecom Security and um, because I looked for new opportunities and new interesting problems to solve. So what do I, what work do I actually work on? So if you, um, if you look at my contract, it says something like senior cybersecurity analyst. Um, this could be anything, could be nothing. But when people ask me, I say I'm a threat intelligence slash malware analyst. And the interesting thing at my, of my work is that I work on two different scales. I've got the mac macro scale, the threat intelligence scale. Um, in a nutshell, threat intelligence is like um, looking into current trends and uh, at um, threats to your organization and the groups and you follow them along and in order to catch them, for example, on your network. Um, and one part of threat intelligence is definitely malware analysis. So that's like solving a puzzle. You're looking into the tools of these threat actors and you rip them apart one piece after piece and then you get an idea what's the capability of a certain group and so on and so forth. And this is where you will always keep on learning. So yesterday I looked into a Maver family at the network protocol and it was Google's protocol buff, buff I used and now I'm looking at the internals of this one. Um, so what kind of work can you actually expect, um, expect when you're going into threat intelligence and Maver analysis? So with threat intelligence, um, I formed part of a, um, of a huge operation which took four years for botnet takedown. There were several, um, several Mayweather families involved, hundreds of thousands of users, not only in Germany but also all over the world, um, were infected. And we're following this um, botnet for four years um, very intensively. So from the threat intelligence side, we wanted to get a big picture all the time. So. Um, what kind of malware was actually distributed in this botnet? What are the, how are the individual tools their malwares are connected? Um, what are the what are the motivations? And um, for example, also what's very interesting for society: who are the victims so in order to notify them? Um, as you can see, this can, um, depending who's your threat actor, this can be, get really political at some point. On the other hand side, um, what I really like is um, like flipping bits. So I did the Maven analysis on many of the um, um, families, so this is really technical. You get to write reports, you get to learn about new stuff, 
Just as I mentioned, now I'm looking, I'm looking into Google protocol buffers in order to understand the protocol of the Swami family I'm looking right now at. Um, you look at um, their weak crypto and you may able to crack it and um, you write a lot of code. So that's um, really cool and I can really recommend to look at this area if, you, if you're into solving of puzzles. So that's it. Thank you for attention. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And this brings us to the last point on today's agenda, the panel discussion for which I ask Parisa, Alena, Thomas, Sergey, and Dirk to join me on the floor. So, welcome here. And this is a panel discussion, but I think we could also accept questions from your side. So, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a sign and I will come back to you. My first question actually is um, for Parisa. Um, looking at your career, I think it's um, amazing, of course, but is it typical that in yeah, such a career that you go more and more away from the technical stuff? So I, I just learned you're managing 400 people, so I assume you're not sitting in front of a computer uh, handling technical details um, whole, whole the day. So is it, is it typical also for um, engineers at Google that during a career you move more and more away from technical stuff and more towards uh, managing stuff or is it just in your case? Uh, let's see, does this work? Yes. Uh, I think that there's not typical. And for me, it wasn't by accident that I moved into uh, management. And I think that's actually been a, a good fit and something I've enjoyed. Um, early on in my career, I found that I was um, very motivated by um, impact. And in some ways, finding that making progress on defense was not so much, ah, we don't know the technical solution for this, but like, ah, people. Uh, and just getting kind of people to work together and uh, kind of have a shared goal or kind of just figuring out like why we couldn't make progress um, was the problems I just constantly kept finding myself attracted to. And at some point my manager asked me if I would uh, be willing to, to manage the team because in some ways I was kind of filling the cracks uh, of the team. And, and I think a lot of ways that's what I see as management or leadership, just helping people to get unblocked. So I don't know if it's, if it's typical. There's, it's definitely a career path. Um, and I think if you like people and if you like managing complexity and kind of breadth, um, there's, I have colleagues who also started as a individual contributor um, and is our, our managers and some of them are a little bit um, uh, maybe shy or embarrassed about like the level of coding that they do, but um, there were some people that raised their hand to watch The Matrix. One of my colleagues, um, his name is El Kamtov, very accomplished hacker, browser security, a uh, guy, he actually found the exploit that was used, um, the SSH exploit that was, was used, and he's a manager too. And so um, you can take that path, mm -hmm. but um, at least at Google, you don't have to. And I think actually um, it's really important that we don't push people into management that uh, don't actually want to manage because it's a different, it's a different uh, skill set. And so at Google, you can advance um, just as far career-wise, by this I mean compensation-wise or title-wise as individual contributor, um, and those folks are, are definitely still um, spending their time, you know, mostly focusing on, on coding. Um, I think uh, I code sometimes on the weekends or will maybe do things that are not in the critical path, but I know that it's more for my own benefit than, um, like, helping the, the team. And so I think there's no typical, you shouldn't feel pushed into anything, and career is super personal. So it's kind of like, how do you want to spend your, your, your day? Okay, thanks. May I add something? This is actually an interesting question and I had this discussion with um, two of my former colleagues who are actually about to turn 40, I'm in my early 30s. Can I actually deliver in still, when I'm 30, 35, 40, still um, the technical stuff, getting right into details because you're getting slower, you, you're getting tired. Can you do it? And this is something you might not think okay, about. <laughs> no, it's, that's in serious. This is something you don't think about when you're 20. You can hack all night long. I did this, but now it's something... On the other hand side, um, the career, it's not everybody can become a manager because then there wouldn't be, would only be managers and nobody underneath in the period. So uh, the careers can go upwards and horizontally and I think that's, yeah. 
Okay, uh, Dirk, you are the only guy on the floor I, with a career. Interesting too, but we don't know details about it yet. So, can you say a few words about your career? I, I will do so for sure. You have asked me to uh, say something about the classes, so therefore I have not put my career into. I answer your question, but I, before I have to respond a little bit on the, your topic, because cybersecurity is not a question of the age. It's something of the understanding in your mindset, but it's deep in your heart. Because uh, uh, exactly, nobody is asking in our organization how old are you and, and, and how uh, uh, how fast you could compile a program or some kind of a new attack or something like this. I think what you shouldn't uh, underestimate is the effect that uh, with a longer time of staying in this area of cybersecurity, you will get more wise. And that means that you have uh, already made some kind of mistake, some kind of failure. They have learned out of this. And you are not doing everything like when you are young and you experiment with. So therefore, you are uh, faster and straighter to the point. And this is exactly something that you shouldn't underestimate. This is a really uh, big advice that I could give everybody here. So therefore, it's not a question about age. I'm already... Uh, uh, 54 years old, so therefore I'm, I'm not feeling that I'm, 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 I'm too old for cybersecurity. So therefore, coming back to your question, what's about my career? Um, I'm deep in my heart an engineer as well. I have studied information technology at the University of Chemnitz, and I have learned to uh, compile uh, a software, a really C++, everything what's around that, really hardware-oriented, interrupt uh, programming, everything what is needed there, and I have designed uh, chips hardware as well, uh, especially the special I.O. ports for the transputer. A lot of you, uh, a lot of, uh, you are knowing only the computer technology, transputer technology, and serial communications nobody knows normally so far. Uh, I have designed those uh, chips, and uh, they were produced by Fujitsu. Therefore, uh, this is a little bit the background of me, and I have started my career uh, with uh, Deutsche Telekom already in 1991, so quite a long time already, and next year we will have uh, 29 years that I'm working with Deutsche Telekom. Uh, in the first years, directly in the technical department as a special engineer to have uh, to, to, to double-check code corrections that the suppliers did for Deutsche Telekom. And the funny stuff was at the end, and a little bit uh, some kind of an anecdote into this uh, story, into uh, when you uh, have spoken with a really big German player, everybody is this company in Munich with S is starting. I don't mention the name, but you could imagine it, it could be. And you were working as an engineer and you, you have uh, seen that there was a mistake in the software into, uh, into and, and, and they have uh, the, the task to, to correct this. And they don't They had no chance to find uh, those mistakes. I don't know why. At the end, as a young engineer, you have corrected this, sent this code to the, to the supplier, and then after four weeks, you, you've got the, the, the really the same code back that you have compiled and given to them. This was exactly the, the, the situation in which I decided, okay, I, I wouldn't work in the technical department anymore. I would like to go into the management to decide that this kind of a stupid stuff is not happening anymore. So, and then, since uh, 1995, I'm uh, in the top management of Deutsche Telekom, working directly uh, and reporting directly to the board of the Dutch Telecom Group, and uh, yeah, so therefore my last job before I, I came to cybersecurity was uh, responsibility for the entire mid-market in Germany, uh, with around about 12,000 people, 5.7 billion revenue responsibility, and this, this shows only that although late, after you have already passed the 50s, you can start uh, directly in cybersecurity, because before it was technology, it is, by the way, very important if you uh, speak about cybersecurity, that you have a really technical background. We have seen so much uh, top managers in this area, which only coming from the management perspective, but they have no clue about what's really ongoing on the machines, uh, ongoing in the code and, and in the memories. And so therefore, it's really a help, helping hand if you have this kind of a technical background. And therefore, I'm very happy. I started in 2015 with cybersecurity, and I, I'm uh, running this uh, worldwide organization of 1,600 uh, cybersecurity experts for Deutsche Telekom globally. Thanks. Sergey. You're representing a startup, so you came from the university and now are working from a startup. How hard is it to come up with a startup? Was it easy? Was it hard? Do you have any... Uh, to be honest, it's uh, the first time for any of the co-founders for us and we didn't know how to do business. So, yeah, then at some point we went to the companies and tried to sell our solution and started with all the technical details, but no one of the other buying center was caring about uh, the technical details. Uh, all they wanted to know is how much money do I save? Uh, do you have the percentage of more security and stuff like that? And this way we kind of made a huge trans uh, transition. Um, so about a year ago, I was uh, like coding four days a week and one day a week I tried to do management. 
And uh, yeah, a few days ago, I started IntelliJ and it told me that the key expired in the end of July. And I was feeling sad a little bit, but <laughs> yeah, you have to continue. And now most of the times what I do in my job is basically replying to emails or coworkers asking me what did I had, uh, why I did uh, something in the code this way like a year ago and then I have to remember. But yeah, I don't code anymore. Hmm. Would you do it again? Yeah. Okay, so because maybe it was a different expectation when you start. Um, okay. I didn't uh, think that it will be that fast. I thought it will okay. be like a three, four year uh, progress, but it just happened in one year. Mm -hmm. Alina, you're still in research. Do you already have plans for the for, for the next steps? So we have Thomas here, just finished, I think, his research career with um, finishing his PhD and now moved to uh, a company. Do you have any plans or do you still think about things? Mm, actually, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. can, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, you can become a professor, for example, if you like. Uh, it's, a long, it's a long trip, I think, because first of all, you have to become an assistant professor and after that, uh, after six years, maybe, maybe not. Um, if you're if you're lucky, you will get a professor after three years, maybe. Let's see. I don't know. I think uh, for Professor Matthew Smith, I think it was like after two years, two and a half years, and he became a professor. And um, I think another uh, another thing uh, or another chance uh, which you can get is you can go to the industry fields, um, or you could also go to the um, Public um, public spaces like öffentlicher um, Dienst, public sector, and uh, there you could help, have, have also your career, or you can go to Google. Um, <laughs> as, as as we mentioned before, just uh, ask uh, us, <laughs> and we will help you. Um, yeah, I think if after you got your security studies done, you have a lot of uh, possibilities and opportunities. I think. I just wanted to add, I think also you can, you, if you go into management, you can go back to being an individual contributor. I actually did some work with the US government. Um, I tried to work with uh, academia and do collaboration. And one of the cool and I think actually important parts of security is that you're constantly learning. So, you know, if you, if you want to go and code again at some point, Sergey, you can. Like, it, it's not a one-way door. And um, I think at some point I, I could totally imagine going back to being a, an individual contributor um, and uh, you know, it, it varies, it's very much a personal choice. And so I think your career can take a lot of, um, we, I don't know if you have this in, in Germany, but uh, instead of thinking of your career as a ladder where you just keep stepping up in terms of title or team size, um, thinking of it as a jungle gym, um, which is sort of this playground, uh, I don't know, is... <laughs> It's, anyways, you don't have to just go up. You can actually uh, navigate uh, around, and I'll find out what the, the right German playground toy is <laughs> to give it. I mean, Irrgarten, or is it? Okay. <laughs> I, would like, I would like to add uh, something on this, what Parisa said, because there's very often the, um, the assumption that, uh, especially young people thinking, okay, I only get uh, in my career successfully when, when, when I am going up and I'm becoming a top manager. Uh, and then I will receive the right salary and then that everything is fine. To be honest, this is not the, the, the original, this maybe it was in the past a little bit the story, but it's currently not the case anymore. Because currently you have a lot of uh, special experts which are paid in this, on the same level like the managers because it's needed to have this uh, technical expertise. And you, sometimes you really underestimate the effect of a technical expertise. And if you have really a crack which is able to, to do the best things in the world, to find out who has created this malware, what is behind them, we are paying them in the same good level like top managers. Why? Because without having the content, the entire company uh, has, has no content anymore. So therefore, the value of the com uh, company is really uh, depending on this kind of an, of, of an expertise. And therefore, don't think that everybody of you which will finish uh, the university has to become, at the end, a top manager to get uh, really a fantastic salary. It is not the case anymore. I think this is something that especially young people sometimes think, thinking too, of, uh, too often about. This is uh, that I would like to, to give you a remark here about uh, it. sort it out in your thinkings. <laughs> I can't say that. 
I, I was just going to say, uh, and professors also make a ton of money, also, right? <laughs> Not in the U.S. either. So. If you want to earn money, you should go to sales because we are hiring <laughs> sales now. And <laughs> Okay, so, um, the, good, the good stuff, uh, we're already acquiring them <laughs> without finishing the curse. It's really good. Nice. Okay, um, thanks for your explanation, Dirk. At least now I understand why Thomas just moved from academia to industry. Um, however, it's, it's, I think it's two months ago, right? So that you moved from um, Fraunhofer to oh, one and a half month. One month. Um, is anything then expected in industry? Or do you already miss something from the academia world? Do you want to come back? <laughs> no, actually, it's uh, quite on the same level. I, I actually, I never was really like in, in, in academia. Like I, wo I worked most of my time at a research institute with Fraunhofer, which is very applied. So I was always working very technical, and um, this is uh, this is what I'm doing right now. I'm just continuing to work, doing the technical work, and um, um, I'm continuing working on this one. And I mean, I still love analysts of malware and I still love to program and this is what I'm planning to do for the future getting in this expert career so as Dirk just said okay thanks so any questions from your side so I think we learned a lot about potential careers insights advices any additional word from your side you want to give if no? I think only two things be courageous enough and experiment, because uh, you, nobody can tell you already the right now what will happen tomorrow, the week after, next month or next year. So therefore, you will be confronted with a lot of things that you don't expect so far. And it's reality. We, are, we have to learn, especially now, it's in constantly learning. The entire stuff of cybersecurity is constantly learning. And by the way, if you think that the biggest asset in cybersecurity is technology, forget it. It's not hardware. It's not software. It's knowledge. It's knowledge about all the different threat vectors, therefore it's so important to have the analysts and to, to know how you have to combat with, uh, those things, what you have to do to protect your organization, to your company, you as an individual. This is exactly the biggest asset and I think this one has to be clear. Therefore, if you're not willing to start a constantly learning, then you're definitely wrong in cybersecurity. Because Although I, I have still to learn a lot of technology stuff, uh, although in the top management, because the, the world is changing. And this is, I think, the biggest, uh, the best remark that, uh, and the best advice that I could give to you. Start this journey and be open, experiment, and be courageous enough to, uh, to, 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 to start new things. Because if you do the old things that you have done ever, then you went, uh, will end up in those uh, uh, um, um, yeah, dead ends, I would like to say, on which uh, everybody else is maybe already uh, going to be stuck. This is something on which you have to be uh, really open about, be courageous, be uh, 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 good enough to, uh, to really experiment with those things. Thanks. I just want to offer, um, uh, I agree that optimize for learning, don't optimize for success. You learn so much more when you fail or struggle than when you success. And I think there's sometimes this pressure of like, ah, oh, I have to get a job and just optimize for what I'm good at or what I really like. But like at this point, don't rush, just learn. Um, I want to give a shout out maybe to some of the women in the, the audience. I see you and uh, you're a minority, but uh, uh, really important. And mostly just from my own personal experience. When I was at University of Illinois, um, was in a computer science uh, field and a, a computer science major and, and I was involved in sort of the student um, talking with the dean about like overall um, transition into the department and teaching and one of the statistics I had learned was that um, uh, the, a number of women transferred out of computer science uh, after starting and before completing um, and tended to have an, an, a grade average, and I don't know how grading is, is done here, but in the US it's A, B, C, D, and F for failure. Um, and so they would have a, like a B minus um, grade point average, and they would say that computer science is too difficult. Um, and then we looked at sort of the, the male slice of the, the uh, cut for people who transferred out of the department, and it was C, so it was actually worse, and they said it wasn't interesting. Um, and so, 
uh, this is not to say that uh, really anything about um, uh, you individually, but there actually is a lot of social science research that shows um, women tend to think about skills as more inherent and like whether you're inherently good at something or, or bad at something. And so if you struggle, then you may think like, ah, this just isn't good for me, as, especially when you are the, the minority and you're like, oh, I don't know if I fit, fit in, I haven't been programming since I was young and like, I don't like love reverse engineering malware and so like, this isn't for me. And this is not to say that's not good, that's awesome, but like if you identify that way and you kind of like keep thinking like, I shouldn't do this, I'm not good at this, um, you may uh, f want to step out of a career for all of the wrong reasons because especially within security, I think failure is so important and you learn from failure. And so don't just optimize for success. Um, know that actually you have an incredibly unique perspective um, to offer and if this is an interesting space, uh, though it can feel alone, I think, uh, lonely, um, uh, I think uh, it's, it's worth trying to um, fight against some of those kind of internal uh, kind of voices that say you don't belong because you, you absolutely uh, do and, and we need more uh, diverse perspectives, not just on gender, but really in general to advance uh, security. And so I'll just say there. Okay, well, then I think we reached the end of the official program. Thanks again for participating in this panel discussion. Thanks to you, and take the opportunity to, to do some bilateral talks right now here. Um, we see every week during lectures, I think Parisa is not here every week, um, unfortunately. You are not here every week like me, so no, um, no. students should take no. the opportunity I to... I have not been shackled take to yet to Bonn. <laughs> The Davos oh. of cybersecurity. Yeah. I'll okay. be here for a little longer. Thanks and enjoy.